This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Paraguay delivers a diplomatic blow to Israel over its embassy in Jerusalem. Where will it end? And President Trump stops all funding to the United Nations body responsible for Palestinian refugees. It hits the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And Jews worldwide celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. Thanks for joining us on this special edition since it marks the first show of our eighth season. We appreciate you watching our program and we love bringing you the news from Jerusalem, Israel and the Middle East. Well, Paraguay delivered a diplomatic blow to Israel when it said it would return its embassy from Jerusalem to Tel Aviv. The move shocked and angered Israel and Paraguay's president said Israel is overreacting. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu instructed his foreign ministry to close its embassy in Paraguay, following Paraguay's announcement that it's moving its embassy out of Jerusalem and back to Tel Aviv. The government of the Republic of Paraguay considers it pertinent to re-establish the seat of the embassy in the State of Israel to the location previous to the communique dated May 9th of 2018. Netanyahu's office said in a statement, Israel views with extreme gravity the unusual decision of Paraguay that will cloud relations between the two countries. Less than four months ago, Paraguay became the third country to move its embassy to Jerusalem after President Trump's historic move of the U.S. Embassy to Jerusalem, and Guatemala followed suit. At the time, Netanyahu hailed deep friendship between the two countries. A great day for Israel, a great day for Paraguay, a great day for our friendship. And this follows the example and the, I would say, the practice of Paraguay for many, many years. Paraguay helped Jews escape Nazi Germany. We will never forget this. Paraguay's move is a diplomatic blow for Israel. Israel had hoped to create momentum for countries to both recognize Jerusalem as its capital and move their embassies here. Paraguay now. said it made the move because it wanted to never. intensify regional diplomatic efforts to achieve a broad, fair and lasting peace in the Middle East. The Palestinians hailed the move as a Palestinian diplomatic achievement. The move came after Paraguay swore in its new president, Mario Abdo, the grandson of a Lebanese immigrant. Netanyahu sent Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat to the inauguration. Barkat tweeted, I will travel to the ends of the earth for Jerusalem and Israel, just as I visited Paraguay at the request of Prime Minister Netanyahu. Their decision is wrong and only strengthens our enemies. I will continue to fight for United Jerusalem, Israel and the truth in every place, in every way. Paraguay's foreign minister, Luis Castiglione, said Israel shouldn't be bothered by the move. Our brothers and friends in Israel should not be upset. There are over 85 countries who maintain their embassies in Tel Aviv, and we are friends and historic allies of Israel. It should not be forgotten that Paraguay's vote was a decisive vote for the creation of Israel. In what some call an historic decision, the Trump administration has moved to stop all funding for UNRWA, the UN agency that provides aid for Palestinian refugees. The decision goes to the core of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Here's our report. Protests popped up in Jordan and in Gaza. Palestinian leaders condemn the action, calling it a path to destruction. What is the American administration doing? They are preempting, prejudging issues that is reserved for permanent status. They are undermining the moderate forces in Palestine and Israel. Those elements who want to achieve peace peacefully based on a two-state solution are being destroyed. Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu applauded the decision. The United States has made a very important thing, stopping the funds for the agency perpetuating refugees called UNRWA. The U.S. is finally beginning to solve the problem. It's historic. I think it's very brave. Uh, I think that for the first time in decades, we are really touching uh, the core issues, uh, and therefore I'm very hopeful. One core issue involves the right of return, which goes back to 1949. It's the idea that the original Palestinian refugees and their descendants should be allowed to return to Israel. That number now totals about 5 million.
So I think President Trump is touching on, on the core issue. The issue is not how large Israel will be or how much territory it will cede, but the question is if Israel will stay. Israel obviously wants to stay, but the Palestinians unfortunately do not accept us yet. Author Adi Schwartz says the right of return means the end of Israel. The right of return means that an infinite number of Palestinians could legally and by agreement enter and resettle the state of Israel. So obviously the real meaning of the right of return is to undo the state of Israel, to kill the state of Israel and to make it into an Arab state. U.S. Ambassador to the U.N. Nikki Haley agrees. But five million Arab Muslims who can say they're not coming down get the right of return off the table. It's not to be negotiated. It's not going to happen. Once it's accepted, it's not going to happen. Then you say, OK, how do we come to terms so we have a two-state solution? Do you agree with that? The right I do, of return I do agree with that. And I think okay. we have to look at this in terms of what's happening in Syria, what's happening in Venezuela, what's happening in other parts of the world, and how we treat refugees and how we're going to look at that going in the future. So I absolutely think we have to look at right of return. In my view, that this is the first time for decades that the American administration is saying the truth. In the meantime, millions of Palestinians languish in limbo. You have this UNRWA agency, which is giving them refugee camps, and they're giving them housing and health care and education. They have no incentive to create their own lives. This is a very bad message to peace and, of course, to their lives as well. I think Palestinians cannot go on with their lives as long as UNRWA stays. One of the main problems with UNRWA is that some say its education system perpetuates the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And they say it's even raising up the next generation of terrorists. This lady with a Palestinian scarf appears harmless, right? But who is this? Dalal al-Mugrabi, who led a, a terrorist attack uh, and murdered 38 people, including 13 children, uh, on the coastal road of Israel in 1978. Her picture appears in the fifth grade Arabic language textbook. It's part of a four page lesson that hails Mugrabi as a martyr who painted with her struggle a picture of challenge and heroism. The text in front of us provides a glance on the path of her struggle. In these four pages, they're praising her and saying what a hero she was and how the younger generation needs to act exactly the same as she did. Israeli Knesset member Sharon Haskell and David Bedin of the Israel Resource News Agency spoke to journalists about reforms they believe need to happen. Some of the major problems with UNRWA are perpetuating the conflict and perpetuating the hatred and the violence between Palestinians and Israelis. CBN News asked UNRWA about the textbooks and education system. In a written statement, spokesman Christopher Gunnis told us, UNRWA teaches in accordance with UN values and principles. By convention, we teach the curriculum of host countries, i.e. the PA curriculum in the occupied territory. We review every book we use. We check for gender bias, age appropriateness, and political neutrality. On average, we have found less than 3% of the pages we have reviewed to be problematic. We have frameworks and procedures for supporting our teachers in dealing with these passages in the books. There are 515,000 Palestinian children in the UNRWA school system. Bedin says if even 2% take up the terror challenge, that would create more than 10,000 terrorists. Bedin sees other issues with UNRWA. UNRWA is different from any other refugee organization because other refugee organizations help people get on with their lives. UNRWA, as a policy, teaches the concept of, of the right of return by force of arms. That so-called right of return is also exaggerated by the very definition of Palestinian refugees. UNRWA's got a completely different refugee definition than any other international organization. In UNRWA, a refugee status can be inherited which means that they do not fulfill their basic agenda for what they were created for. It continues to build bigger and bigger refugee camps, give them permanent housing, give them permanent health care, give them a permanent education system. This is the role of a country, not a relief agency. Haskell and Bedin hope that President Trump's action to cut funding will force UNRWA to make changes. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Tension is growing between Iran and the United States that could be leading to a possible showdown.
The latest came when Iran's president called U.S. sanctions against Iran's oil industry the front lines of confrontation. Take a look. President Trump says Iran is on the ropes. If you look at Iran, the first day that I got to office, or let's look at it differently, a day before I got to office, everybody was saying Iran would be taking over the Middle East. It was just a question of when. Now they're just looking to survive. For months, demonstrators on the streets of Tehran and other cities have defied the regime. Protesters blame their leaders for the crumbling economy by spending Iran's treasure on foreign wars throughout the Middle East. Iran's currency is plummeting and reached its lowest rate on record. There is no glimmering of hope that the, the situation changes. Up to now, I've seen no kind of uh, practical and effective uh, way of the, the practical effective solution on behalf of the government to solve this problem. It's part of the administration's plan. If I get the logic of it, and there is, I think there is a logic to it, is that through economic sanctions that then produce internal unrest and therefore pressure on the regime, the regime has to start thinking twice about its ability to maintain these far-flung commitments across the region. The U.S. fanned the flames by pulling out of the Iranian nuclear deal, reimposing sanctions, and there's more to come. Remember that in November, we have the beginnings of you know, oil sanctions on Iran, the, the intention to end Iran's ability to export oil. So we have a very major new blow. So we're just at the beginning of this to a certain degree, the beginning of real Western pressure on Iran. Iran's President Rouhani promises further defiance. We will continue by all means to produce and export our oil. Oil is in the front line of confrontation. Iran also warned it could shut down the Straits of Hormuz, through which much of the world's oil passes. Another front line is this ongoing war in Israel's regular air assault on Iran's growing military presence inside Syria. The IDF says it has hit more than 200 Iranian targets in the past two years. So there's a whole bunch of you know, potential tools in the box, so to speak, to continue to put pressure on the regime, economic, political and military. And I think what we're going to be seeing in the months ahead is an increasing usage of those and an increasingly coordinated usage of those to try to roll back in our across, the, across the region. Coming up, the special role the Philippines has played in the history of Israel and the Jewish people. Filipino President Rodrigo Duterte became the first Filipino president to visit Israel when he came for a four-day state visit. Duterte met with Israel's top leaders, visited Israel's Holocaust Memorial Yad Vashem, and signed joint agreements between the Philippines and Israel. During his meeting with President Duterte, Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu reflected on the special role the Philippines has played in Israel's history. We remember the exceptional role of the Philippines that received Jewish refugees during the Holocaust. We remember that the Philippines was the only Asian country that voted for the establishment of the State of Israel in the UN resolution in 1947. Mr. President, we remember our friends. And that friendship has blossomed over the years. Duterte said now Israel is helping the Philippines. Mr. Prime Minister, I can only thank you so much, uh, especially the critical help that you have extended my country in time when we needed it most. Filipino flags line Jerusalem streets in honor of President Duterte's visit. During his visit, he signed a number of agreements with Israel, including trade, science, and caregiving. There's been a remarkable phenomenon in Israel where thousands and thousands of families have taken heart from the support given by Filipino care workers to the elderly. Thank you for hosting almost 28,000 Filipinos. Uh, they have been uh, very happy working here taking care of the aging citizens. And uh, I have heard that they have been treated as uh, human beings. Uh, unlike in other places, of which I am not at liberty to mention now. Duterte also visited Israel's Holocaust Museum, Yad Vashem. Never again may the world learn the lessons of this horrific, unbenighted period of human history. Israel's president also greeted Duterte during the first visit of a Filipino president 
since the countries established diplomatic relations in 1957. We have uh, so many things in common. We read the same Bible. And so that explains the more uh, uh, bond that uh, exists uh, between us. CBN News spoke with one of the members of the delegation who hopes the visit marks a greater level of cooperation. We would like to create a relationship of economic partnership, uh, exploring what businesses can be done here as we explore what businesses can be done in our part of the world. We are also here to explore the strength of the Israeli government and people in relation to security in relation to protecting your sovereignty and your lands and your rights. Some protesters criticized Duterte's visit because of human rights abuses and his crackdown on drug dealers and controversial statements. But Israeli leaders greeted him warmly. Up next, a trip to a shofar factory where they make the biblical ram's horns. We're entering a special season of biblical holidays. These Jewish holy days begin with Rosh Hashanah, the traditional New Year, and include Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement. And there's more to this season, and the Bible points the way. Rosh Hashanah literally means head of the year, the New Year. But biblically, it's much more than that. In the book of Leviticus, it's called Yom Teruah, the day of the blowing of trumpets, or ram's horn, the judgment day. The only commandment during Rosh Hashanah is actually to hear the sound of the shofar. Okay. And so everybody gathering in the synagogue to hear the sound of the shofar. It's something that people connect to their soul to hear the sound of the shofar. The piercing sound of the shofar is meant to remind the hearers to repent of their sins and to make things right with their brothers and sisters. The rabbis say that reconciliation with God and man confounds the enemy. A shofar is a musical instrument made from a horn. This is the oldest uh, musical instrument. And the Jewish Orthodox who have a committee to hear the sound of the shofar during a new year, the, our uh, ju judgment day. As part of a two-family business, Eli Ribach is a third-generation shofar maker. The process is uh, poly grinding, polishing, then we drill an uh, open uh, mouthpiece. This is uh, quick, but it's a lot of experience and a lot of hand uh, work because each horn is a different size, different thickness, so you have to be experienced to make a good shofar. The ram's horn is used as the traditional shofar because when Abraham showed his willingness to sacrifice his son Isaac, God provided a ram to be used in his place. It's actually, all type of horns are kosher, except of a cow. That's because the Jewish people don't want to remind God of the time Israel worshipped the golden calf in the wilderness. Besides the distinctive tones of the different horns, there are three different blasts sounded. The shofar is blown in synagogues and at the Western Wall each morning, for a month before the holiday to give plenty of time for repentance. You and I both know that uh, we need a lot of reminders in our daily life to repent, to think of the things of God. It's like an alarm clock for the soul. Reebok says it's not just Jewish people who blow the shofar. We sell the shofar all over the world. We sell it to Jewish, to Christian, uh, Messianic people, evangelist people. Rosh Hashanah is the feast of the seventh month, but in Jewish tradition, represents the new year. At the coronation of the kings of Israel, the shofars would blow. They would announce the new king or they would announce the coming of the king. Oftentimes in the Christian world, shofars are blown throughout the entire year. But in Judaism and in Jewish practice, those shofars are only blown for a very limited time throughout the year. During this time, the month of Elul and Rosh Hashanah, Boaz Michael, founder of First Fruits of Zion, says that's a foreshadow for those who believe in Yeshua, Jesus. And they tell us something. They're speaking to us. They're reminding us of something. And one of the things they're reminding us of is the creation of the world, 
the coming of the king, King Messiah one day at this time, uh, the coronation of his kingdom here on earth. This is what the shofar is to remind us of, and it's, it speaks to us every day when we hear that sound. Coming up, a look at what you need to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, the Jewish New Year. We just saw how shofars are made and how important they are to this holiday season. Here's a look at what else you need to celebrate Rosh Hashanah and what you can find on our social media channels. Well, that's all for this edition. Thanks for joining us. Remember, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. And for all of our Jewish viewers, Shana Tova Umetuka, a good and sweet new year. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.